Hey everybody, so welcome to another edition in this mini series where I am interviewing authors who have recently published books on various data topics. So today we are going to be joined by Patrick Lamb. He has just recently published a book all about knowledge auditing. And what's interesting is this book isn't necessarily walking through how to do a knowledge audit, although he does touch on that a little bit. A lot of it is what is knowledge auditing? Why should you care about doing this? What does this look like for an organization? And what are some of the benefits? So I really, really appreciate this. If you are especially, you know, doing a lot of research or maybe you're working on a dissertation or something along these lines, this is a fabulous book to look at. But also if you're just trying to figure out how to describe this to your organization, I think this is another reason to pick up the book. This is not a paid promotional video. I am doing this because I read the book, I really liked it, and I really like Patrick Lamb and what he's trying to do. So that's why he's on the channel with us today. Also, all of the books that we review in this series are going to have a giveaway for one lucky person that is going to be submitted through what is described in the description box below. Make sure you check that out if you are interested in getting into the drawing for that. All right, so. With that, if you are interested in knowledge auditing, make sure you stick around. My name is Patrick Lamb. I am supposedly based in Singapore, where I have a company called Straits Knowledge. Uh, actually, um, for most of this year and last year, I've been based in Ireland. I have a home in Ireland, uh, and it's beautiful summer weather here. My background is uh, I studied philosophy and theology for my first degree. I then went into library science, got a master's in librarianship, worked in special uh, an academic libraries for a number of years in the UK. And then I ran away to Singapore, got into learning and development training. When knowledge management arrived in Asia in the late 1990s, I discovered I had the two halves of knowledge management, how you organize stuff and make it accessible for use and how you help people acquire knowledge and um, improve based on it. So that's my life history in a nutshell. All right, so jumping right in. So this book, you know, based on the title, is is very focused on knowledge auditing. So what does that mean and why is that important? So when people talk about knowledge auditing, generally speaking, they are talking about uh, conducting some kind of evaluation um, of, uh, and it's usually got two, two kind of areas of focus. One is on what knowledge do we have in the organization? How are we using it? Where are the mm -hmm. gaps? How can we improve that? How can we make better use of it? Mm -hmm. And the other area of focus um, is uh, what kinds of knowledge management processes do we have? What kind of enablers, culture, how do we set goals, how do we govern it, and so on. So there are those two sort of areas. And you know, I, mean, I spend quite a lot of time in the book um, trying to unpick mm -hmm. what people mean by auditing, even. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, quite apart from knowledge management, the term auditing can have a, a many different senses. Yeah. In general, people are talking about evaluating mm -hmm. um, their, their knowledge management, either their knowledge content or their knowledge management practices mm -hmm. in order to uh, define some kind of improvement or feed into a knowledge management strategy or mm -hmm. figure out goals for knowledge management. So it's a preliminary step to yeah, a it's knowledge getting management. Getting that baseline, plan. right, is yeah. understanding what do we have now, what are we doing now, and then where do we right. want to go from here? Right. But then a big piece of it is also the inventory piece, so the, <clears throat> figuring out what we have, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, what kinds of knowledge resources do we have, where do they sit, and so on, which in itself is not an evaluation. It's just mm -hmm. a description mm -hmm. of what you have, which, is, which but, but turns out to be quite important as a foundational step mm -hmm. for understanding what you can do next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because in, in the rest of this series of, you know, authors for, for some of the books that have been coming out recently, um, we have a few folks that are talking about like data catalogs and things. And I know, you know, auditing what you have, whether you go into data catalog or not, you don't have to uh, for knowledge management. But for those that are doing that, um, the audit process is actually really important to understand um, the level of lift to, to get into a data catalog or to create, you know, a knowledge graph uh, for perhaps what you, your organization right. is trying to put things together. Um, I used to work for um, a fairly large aircraft manufacturer, and uh, they used a lot of what you're saying is the knowledge auditing to understand um, what knowledge artifacts each 
step in the manufacturing process needed. And it was really interesting because they wanted it to be presented on almost like the schematic of the aircraft and to say, okay, here are the knowledge artifacts for this part and these pieces and these processes of, of the aircraft. So, you know, I can attest that this is um, something that a lot of folks get involved in um, to understand the inner workings of their organization and, and how those pieces fit together and where there's gaps, where there's maybe over-indexing. So I think that this is all very necessary, especially now where we're trying to understand, um, a lot of folks are trying to understand how to, uh, you know, cut costs or make things more efficient. Knowing what you have, where that comes from is is a big part of that. Uh, and now I remember I my background is in library information science. So I, I came into knowledge management and knowledge auditing from an information management and an information auditing um, background. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I adapted it. So instead of just uh, auditing information resources, we we uh, used a typology developed by Dave Snowden, it's described in the book, uh, for different forms of knowledge, including tacit forms of knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's an expanded sort of form of audit. But the 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 methodology of the audit was more or less uh, derived from the information auditing um, practice mm -hmm. practices that were around at the time. And and when I <laughs> I started reading. I discovered that there were many other feeder disciplines into knowledge auditing uh, mm -hmm. and and producing very different forms of knowledge audits mm -hmm. and different inconsistent claims and different vocabularies, different words describing the same thing and uh, the same word meaning different things. Yeah, so that was I mean that was that was exactly the, the sort of the, the need that surfaced as I started the work, right? So I'm, I've got all of these competing vocabularies and these competing practices, all laying claim to nominally the same activity, um, but but with no common ground between them and no sort of translation mechanisms mm -hmm. to deal with. So I, I kind of struggled um, and, and I finally realized that I just had to back, I had to go upstream. I had to mm -hmm. I had to write this book <laughs> just to be able to write the second book. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's really to clarify the concepts, the vocabulary, the relationships, put mm -hmm. a bit of rigor uh, into uh, the methodologies, uh, question the methodologies that are a bit shaky or don't seem to have good uh, foundations. Yeah. Um, and, and, and provide some frameworks for figuring out and explaining. Mm -hmm what it is you're doing, why you're doing it to your stakeholders and sponsors. Because mm -hmm. that's that's the other issue with ambiguity. You have different people describing your, your activity in different ways or understanding. You know, I, I say I'm going to do a knowledge uh, audit and they think I'm going to do a knowledge management evaluation. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing mm -hmm. on knowledge resources, right? Or uh, I say I'm going to do a knowledge audit and they think I'm going to do a, a knowledge map. You know, as you described, you know, look at my... Uh, air, airline, uh, my uh, airplane mm -hmm. schematics, and and figure out what knowledge resources I need to support the production or, or management or maintenance of these mm -hmm. parts of the airplane. Uh, and actually, all I'm going to do is look at your knowledge management culture. <laughs> yeah. So you you know you, this just be, just being able to communicate to your sponsors and stakeholders in consistent ways uh, clearly is you know one one I hope one of the benefits. Yeah. Of of the book, uh, uh, quite apart from just being able to plan and, and um, uh, audits in a in a systematic way, in a way that can be described to peers, uh, that results can be compared over time. You know, consistency, mm -hmm. uh, uh, consistent language, and the ability to communicate vertically and laterally. Well, and you know, this is, and Patrick, I hope I hope you realize I don't ever say you know I would I would I would sponsor this book for this reason but i would say that based on my personal experience and working with a lot of companies that have tried to get into knowledge management and understand you know again jumping into you know the uses of it with you know a, a data catalog and other things the biggest missing piece is the culture shift and understanding how to understand what's going on now and how to get your stakeholders on, you know, even on the same page as you as to what you do now, because most folks are like, well, I can find what I need and that's just fine. I'm good. I'm good. Therefore, everyone else must be good. <laughs> and that's right. not true. Right. That's that's certainly not true. Um, you know, I talk about this data therapy thing a little bit where you kind of have to like sit down and talk to people about things. 
this this book helps you prepare for those, I think, because it helps you ask the right questions. And that's really what you're doing when you're you're starting this journey is understanding how to answer uh, your stakeholders' needs. But to answer those, you just need to have you know the, the the good questions to ask and to understand and have that empathy and and try to figure out how people are doing things. And so I think that's that's the itch that this book scratches. And I think that that is so needed because I hear it all the time. If your culture isn't uh, on board with this, it's going to fail. A lot of data catalogs, a lot of other pro- you know projects like that, um, right? Don't yeah. do well because of this. So. I- so I want to come back to uh, something you said you, you referred to earlier, which is the lift that's required to get one of these things done, um, mm-hmm. and and as so link it to this, you know, asking good questions. I think um, one important uh, area that I was trying to address in the book was getting clarity of goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because if you have clarity of goals and can communicate them uh, to your sponsors and stakeholders and, and participants in an audit. Just makes stuff so much easier. Um, um, yeah. But if you have clarity of goals, then it 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 means that you are better informed in your choice of methods and tools. Mm-hmm. And there is a variety of methods and tools that you can use to support uh, knowledge audits and, and other forms of audit. And and depending on what your focus is and what your goals are, you would use different um, um, methods and tools. That seems obvious. It's not. It's not evident in practice mm-hmm. because a lot of the documented practice around knowledge audits is based on surveys and interviews mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which are not really good evidence surfacing methods for collecting um uh, you know good views of a complex knowledge landscape where most of the interesting knowledge work is actually not visible it's the oh, stuff that's sure. going on in people's heads and between people in in informal interactions and so on so I think having that um, sense of clarity about goals, having a sense of a portfolio of methods and tools that you can use, mm-hmm. and and the ability to choose intelligently between them, depending on your goals, I think that's that's uh, you know one of the key things that I was trying to address in the book. And if you are an external um, consultant, you have the benefit that the project has been defined mm-hmm. and the scope is priced and resourced. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, you, you have the <laughs> right, uh, which 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 may not be. I mean, going back to your early earlier reference to the lift required, mm-hmm. may not be true of I- internal practitioners, mm-hmm. and so they may find it harder to harness internal resources to get mm-hmm. the level of participation that they need. Oh, absolutely, for a, good, a yeah. good good audit. On the other hand, uh, when something uh, like a knowledge audit, which is really about figuring out the internal workings. Mm-hmm. Um, when something like an, uh, an an external consultant is is engaged on a contract in a project to deliver an audit and maybe a, a strategy uh, out of it, um, the the challenge is getting that the, the the sustainability and the you know the flow into the change in the organization that's required. Oh, yeah. And so we've learned over the years to um, to try and get some component of in, of well first of all you know capacity building for the clients that you've transferred mm-hmm. the capability into the client most of our uh, workshops for example within the consulting engagement are also intended as knowledge transfer workshops mm-hmm. for the internal team mm-hmm. right so they they pick up the methodology they understand how it works and they can continue to apply it um but but we also now try and ensure that there is at least some element of implementation in a project Mm -hmm. if you're doing a knowledge audit and you haven't resourced the follow-up actions of whatever they are you know some Mm -hmm. provision some recognition that there needs to be a follow-up otherwise what's the point in doing it Mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's i i'm so happy to hear that there's um quite a few folks that i know in the industry that you know they've worked with consultants and they didn't plan for that part and so you know, I have a video on the channel like, oh, you have an all, uh, you have a ontology now what, right? Which is not a good place to to necessarily be in. Um, I think that this is is a similar case where, okay, great, you've got the audit, now what, right? Like nobody wants to right. sit there and and say that because you can, especially if you have clearly defined where you need um, to to bulk something up or to make something more efficient or you know whatever it is, 
if you have those clear things, um, but no resourcing or know how, right, to to do it um, in practice, then it's it's not it's not going to really be w- worth it. But I'm glad that you have that as part of what you're doing. And I I also know from my own experience working on the other side of it, right, like working with consultants, they don't all do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm glad that, that that's part of, of the thing here. Uh, as you probably know, we, I, I do work in taxonomy development as well. Mm-hmm. And taxonomy development, there's no point in doing it if you're not working it into search, right? So this is yes. about findability and discoverability and accessibility yeah. and being able to navigate content. And and the more you go um, in, in, into organizations and you do, you know, you, you, you refer to, you have an ontology now what, right? So mm-hmm. you have an ontology now what, you have a, a search specification now what, but but there's nobody in the organization who knows how to configure your search, your SharePoint search. Let's say you're using SharePoint. Oh, no. <laughs> so you've got you've got your search requirements, the, the system integrator can come in and do it, and then it's just left and it's not being maintained and role and search needs to be maintained, right? Oh, just like taxonomy. Sure. Yeah. It's just like content, right? Yeah. So that 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 is something that I'm seeing in all kinds of areas in knowledge management, in taxonomy and search, in in digital transformation. It's just everybody's relying on outsourcing. Yeah. The internal capacity is not being built. Mm-hmm. And that means nobody can really play with the toys. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I think it's also um you you play too much telephone. Um now again, no no disrespect to anyone that is a small company and they have to outsource or a large company that wants to outsource (laughs) because they're focusing on other things. Um, But I do think that that's the the caution here is if you are doing that, make sure that you do have that constant knowledge transfer and that you at least have a a handful of people, if you can, uh, that, that are kind of working alongside the consultants because the consultants will eventually walk away. I worked at one company where um, they were a tech company, but they did not have a lot of engineers, strangely. Um, and so they had to bulk it out with, um, you know, contractors. And they were fabulous. Don't get me wrong, the folks that we worked with. But then they eventually had to walk away. And then the rest of us were looking at everything they built and we're like, Ugh. like we knew where the code base was. We knew, you know, we knew where the stuff was but the well why did you make this decision and why is it set right. up in this right. configuration all of that was lost um now you can again maybe this is you know your knowledge management piece you know document these things document your decision making making sure or like you know there's ways that you can do that knowledge transfer so this is the cautionary tale to audience that's listening um make sure that's part of the work you're doing with engineers, if it's like a way work, like engineers from you know, maybe another part of your organization or contractors, because um, you need to be able to, you need to be able to tell when something smells funny too, right? Like, right, right, is that really right, what we right. need to do? Is that really, the, right. do we really need all that? All You need someone to be able to help you with that. And usually uh, folks with skin in the game at the company are usually the ones that can do that. Yeah, so if you look at um, the NASA, you know, the classic NASA example of forgetting how to build a Saturn V rocket, right? Mm-hmm. So they, they actually did have specs and, and they had documentation and records kept. Not wasn't perfect, but they, they were able to do it. And it, in that case, it wasn't because well, they did outsource, but it wasn't because they had outsourced. It was, it was largely because funding for deep space travel disappeared in the 80s. Yeah. And so that that whole generation uh, was laid off or retired. And then w- when they wanted to come back and build a rocket that was powerful enough to to pull uh, human beings outside the the, the Earth's gravitational uh, field, they discovered that they had the documentation, but they didn't know how to work it, just exactly as mm-hmm. you described. Mm-hmm. And if you look now at, at NASA's knowledge management program, which was largely shaped by that experience, as well as the Challenger and Columbia exa- yeah. disasters, their knowledge management programs are are not just about documenting stuff, but mm-hmm. about keeping not keeping critical knowledge in circulation. Yeah, meaning people are interacting, people are asking questions. If just like you say, if if you have consultants in, you've got somebody, two or three people sitting alongside them, asking them irritating questions. Okay, why did yeah. you make that decision? Or right. you know, what was go- why did you move this way and not that way uh, in, in that in that choice of action? Yeah. 
uh, why did you think it smelt funny? Yeah. <laughs> to take your analogy. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. So if anyone is interested in more on the uh, knowledge management at NASA, Ed Hoffman also has a book and I interviewed him on the channel. So I will put that link down I below. I saw that, yes. Yeah. yeah. Nice He's interview. great. For those that you know are thinking about picking up this book, what are some of the things that you feel they will get out of this? You know, what, what's your pitch for folks to, to pick this book up and, and utilize it? There are people who are experienced mid-career mm -hmm. in knowledge management who um, have been, you know, doing different, have maybe had a couple of roles, have tried different things, different, different contexts and experiences, and they want to make sense of the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. They want to consolidate them and build on their knowledge. And and I hope this book is a is a, a way of helping them do that because it does it does look at fundamentals, it looks at principles, mm -hmm. it looks at frameworks for mm -hmm. integrating uh, different practices and, and different frame um, different different uh, concepts within the knowledge management field. Uh, then there are the people who are you know explicitly concerned about the conduct of knowledge audits. They they want to do knowledge management planning exercises, or they want to review their knowledge management programs. Or they want to do something very targeted, you know, like you described, which is doing inventories mm -hmm. for a specific process or a specific product or a specific customer base and, and look mm -hmm. at uh, improvements. And they want a systematic approach to doing that. And mm -hmm. they want to have a sense of options and mm -hmm. some control over what they're doing, not just blindly following, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some five step slide from, from somewhere <laughs> on the Internet. Uh, so I think those are the two main audiences. Um, I hope it will be useful uh, in teaching knowledge management at master's level or mm -hmm. beyond, because that that's the, the the next generation, right? It's absolutely it's the next generation of practitioners coming online. Yeah, and you know, honestly, like looking through some of your chapters, I wasn't lying when I wish this was around. Um, tacit knowledge played very heavily in my dissertation. Really wish I had this to cite back. <laughs> 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 so there's my endorsement. If you're a PhD or master's student in anything dealing with information, data science, people like trying to figure out how to structure knowledge so that humans and computers, you know, who coexist with this stuff can use it. This is probably a good book to read. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Thank you.